from here with the term Good Samaritan. And if you ask those people, what is a Good Samaritan? They would simply tell you, a Good Samaritan is a person who helps strangers out in emergencies. It's a Good Samaritan. Because after all, we have Good Samaritan laws in this nation that protect the person if they're trying to save a life from liability of getting sued. We have Good Samaritan laws. That's how well known this parable is. But I hope and I pray that as you leave this morning, as you leave God's house, you have a much better understanding of the parable of the Good Samaritan. So let's stand in honor of the reading of God's Word as we read from Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind and your neighbor, as yourself. And he said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So... Which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Almighty God, we confess, Lord, our preconceived notions and ideas and stereotypes as we come to this text. Lord, we confess them to you. And, oh God, I pray that your people, as well as I, would forget about all of the stereotypes, all of what we think we know about this parable. And we would focus on the truth of your words. Lord, we need you now. We ask, Lord, please, speak truth into our lives and change us and give us the courage to most importantly apply, apply these truths into our world today. Thank you that you will answer our prayer for you are faithful and you are good and your mercy endures forever. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I hope that you realize just after reading this passage, the theme, the main theme of the passage is not helping a stranger in emergency. It's about loving one's neighbor. That's what Jesus is teaching here. Loving one's neighbor. What does that look like? How do we do it? What should be our motivation for it? 
And it speaks truth into our very lives today. So let's get started. Point number one, is it important to love your neighbor as yourself? That's a question. Is it important to love your neighbor as yourself? Because verses 25 to 28 often get left out of this parable. But they're very important. We're going to study verses 25 to 28. Because, look at verse 25. A certain lawyer, and this is not a lawyer like we would think of today, an attorney, but this man was an expert on the Old Testament law. Okay? He was an expert on the Old Testament law. This lawyer stood up, and he wanted to test Jesus publicly. Now remember, he was a very educated, learned man, an expert on the Old Testament law, and he wanted to test Jesus, and he asked, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Let's stop there. If someone were to ask you, Rod, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? If somebody was to ask me, Pastor Wes, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? I wouldn't give them the response that Jesus did. Would you? I would probably quote maybe John 3.16 to them. Wouldn't you? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Or maybe I'd be like Paul with the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16 when he said to, to Paul and Silas, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? What did Paul say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You shall be saved, you and your household. But Jesus, he didn't do that, did he? Look at verse 26. He said to this lawyer, he asked him a question. Well, what is written in the law? What's your reading of it? And the man, of course, quoted Deuteronomy chapter 6 and Leviticus chapter 19, two different passages in the Old Testament because he knew he was an expert on the law. And this is what he said. He answered verse 27 and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said in verse 28, You have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. Whoa, is Jesus here proposing a works-oriented type of salvation? I mean, is he saying you got to obey the law, do this and you will live? Where's the grace? Is Jesus contradicting everything he taught in the Gospel of John about believe and live? No, of course he is not. Of course he's not. He's not contradicting himself here. He's just saying, look at subpoint C, to love the Lord your God with all your being and your neighbor as yourself is not something less than faith. It's not something less than faith. What Jesus is saying here is you must live out your faith. You must live it out. This is what it is to walk in covenant relationship with your God. To what? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your strength, and all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. This is what Jesus was teaching him, and this is what he's teaching us. Because the point, truth is, and look at subpoint D, what we are cannot be separated from what we do. What we are cannot be separated from what we do. You can't tear these things apart or separate them. And isn't this what Jesus taught us last week, those of you who were here last week, in the parable of the sower, the parable of the soils, remember that? What is, the, what is the seed that fell on the good ground? What was the difference between the seed that fell on the good ground and the other three? Fruit. Fruit. Remember what Jesus said at the end of that parable last week we learned? Who are? Who are my mothers? Who, who are my brothers? Those who hear the word of God and do it. And do it. So, I've made this mistake. Many pastors have. We, we are so afraid. And, 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 and the Christian church, the evangelical church today, is so afraid to even go into any kind of thing that they would be misunderstood as works-based or works-oriented salvation. We are so afraid of that because we say, what well, we're saved by grace through faith. And that is true. But if we have true faith, it's going to work out how we live. So this is what Jesus' point was to law. This is the reason he didn't quote what he said in John 3.16. He, 
He didn't say what Paul said. What he was saying is, is look, you have to become more than a man of knowledge. You got to become a man of practice. That was his message to the lawyer. That's his message for us today. We got to we got to stop being just people, people of knowledge. We got to be people of practice. Put the knowledge into practice. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, all of your soul, all of your strength, and all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Put it into practice. This is why he told the parable, isn't he? Because he could have just left it at that, couldn't he? I mean, he could have just ended right there in verse 28. He said, hey, do this and, and you will live. But the lawyer, he wanted to justify himself, didn't he? So he had to further the conversation. I'm glad he did. He wanted to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? That's what the lawyer wanted to know. So, point number two, who is included as my neighbor? That's a good question. It's important to love your neighbor as yourself. Matter of fact, it's more than important, it's vital. It's vital that we do this. I think Jesus taught us this. But who is included? as my neighbor. That's what the lawyer wanted to know. And really, he wanted to know who he could exclude as his neighbor. That's really what the lawyer wanted to know. You know, who do I really have to love as my neighbor? I mean, isn't it just the fe my fellow Jews? I mean, I don't have to love anybody else, right? Not the Gentiles and certainly not the Samaritans. Just who can I exclude? That was really his motive for wanting to justify himself. Who is my neighbor, Jesus? Why don't you explain this to me? And Jesus basically said, okay, I'm glad you asked. There was a certain man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him and departed and left him, the Bible says, Jesus said, half dead. Half dead. I want to ask you a question. Does Jesus identify this man in verse 30? No. There's a no identification. He said what? A certain man. And this man was not only identified by Jesus, he was not only refused Jesus to identify him, he what? He was stripped of his clothing. So there, he basically had no ID. You could identify people in ancient times by the clothing that they wore. But this man, the thief, stripped him of all of his clothing and beat him half dead. So there he was, lying there, dying, half dead. He was a certain man. The point of it is, is he was a human being. That's the point Jesus is making. Who's included as my neighbor? Jesus' point here is you know what? Every human being is included as my neighbor. So neighbors, note this, neighbors have no geographical, cultural, social, economic, or ethnic boundaries. They don't. That's the point. Now this should not shock us, but it does. You know why? Because every one of us have been conditioned to believe Neighbors have all of these boundaries. Jack Miller moved next door to my mother and father in 1980. I was six years old. And I guess when I was eight or nine years old, I started calling Jack and Pam Miller my neighbor. And to this day, almost 40 years later, well, on Christmas Day or Christmas Eve, when I went up to visit my parents, I saw Jack out in the yard. You know what I hollered at him? Howdy, neighbor. Not hey neighbor, but howdy neighbor. And he hollers back, hey neighbor, at me. Because we have what? This old joke that's been going on almost 40 years. Howdy neighbor. Why? Because he's in close proximity. And after all, didn't we sometimes watch Sesame Street? Or at least our children did. What did, they, what did Sesame Street teach us? Who are the people in your neighborhood? In your neighborhood. And... Don't forget Mr. Rogers. Won't you be my neighbor? So what? We are conditioned to think, oh, there's geographical boundaries. Oh, and certainly there are cultural boundaries, right? There's social boundaries. There's economic boundaries. And oh, isn't there ethnic? Isn't there ethnic boundaries? Oh, yeah, we all know that, right? Our neighbors are people just like us. Huh. 
You think Jesus blew that out of the water? You say, I don't know, Pastor. I need a little bit more evidence than verse 30. I mean, I know he said a certain man he didn't identify. Him. Okay, imagine you're the lawyer. Who are your heroes as an expert in law and, and, and Old Testament law? You know who would be your heroes? Priests and Levites. So Jesus goes on, look at verse 31. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road. And when he saw the man, he did what? Passed by on the other side. And then, likewise, a Levite. When he came down to the place, he looked and he passed by on the other side. Of course, you get the comparisons here, I think, to, to help you out a little bit in our Southern Baptist life or evangelical life. Pastor West, a pastor came down the road. He saw the man lying there. What did pastor do? He went around on the other side. The chairman of the deacons came down that road. He saw the man, likewise, he went around on the other side. This was shocking to the man, to the lawyer. He couldn't believe it. Come on, a priest, a Levite. They must be willing to help this man. They were his heroes. They were his neighbors, those in close, close proximity, those who shared his culture, the priest, the Levite. Surely they would help, but no, they went around on the other side. Now, we don't know why. You know, you've heard this in Sunday school. Maybe they were afraid. Maybe they thought the robbers were going to attack them. Maybe. Maybe it was a ceremonial law about, you know, touching a corpse and being around a corpse. The rabbis taught you couldn't come within six feet of a corpse or else you were ceremonially unclean numbers, took a number, seven days. And by the way, it was expensive and it was a lot of trouble to go through the cleansing process seven days. So maybe they just didn't want, maybe they thought the guy was dead. They probably thought he was dead. Well, I don't want to get too close to him. I, the, the rabbis say, the law says that they made up, you can't get within six foot of a dead body. So that's the reason they went around on the other side. Stay far away from them. And then Jesus said this, and I'm sure the lawyers jaw dropped. Look at verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. Samaritan. Remember, the Jews hated the Samaritans, and the Samaritans, they loathed the Jews. There was so much hostility. The Jews considered the Samaritans a mixed race. They had intermarried with other Gentiles, and they were not pure Jews. And they, they only adhered to the first five books of the Bible, not the whole Old Testament. And they worshipped in the wrong place. And these Samaritans, these Samaritans were awful people, and the Jews loathed the Samaritans. They did. And then Jesus says, a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and this Samaritan was different. You know what was different about him? Look at point number three. What is the inspiration for loving your neighbor as yourself? This Samaritan had inspiration that the priest and the Levite did not have. This Samaritan had inspiration for loving his neighbor as himself. Did you catch it in verse 33? Do you see it in verse 33? Can you pick out the word in verse 33? The last word. He had compassion. Compassion. Compassion is simply actively sympathetic concern for the suffering of another. Another word for it is mercy. That's what this Samaritan had that the priest and the Levite did not have. He had compassion and it moved him to action. Look at verse 34. So the Samaritan went to him. He went to him. He approached him. He wasn't worried about being ceremonially unclean. He wasn't worried about the other robbers attacking him. Maybe he was, but it didn't matter. He went to him, and he bandaged his wounds. He poured on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal and brought him to an end, and he what? Took care of him. He took care of him. And then, the next day, when he departed, he gave two denarii. That's probably enough for two weeks' worth of lodging and food, and gave them to the innkeeper and said, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I come again, I'll repay you. What was different about the Samaritan? He had compassion. Brothers and sisters in Christ, this hurts. I know. I meant to forewarn you about that. 
this hurts. Because this hurt me as I was studying this parable. You've heard stepping on my toes. Let me tell you, the Lord Jesus Christ left my toes bloodied this week because I had to come to grips with this. Wes, where is your compassion? Where has it gone? Where's your compassion? Would you have to ask yourself that? Where is my compassion? Because I want to ask, has repeated exposure, repeated exposure to overwhelming world needs robbed Christians today, robbed us today of the inspiration to show mercy and compassion? Because I don't know about you, but I can remember when I was eight, nine years old watching television in the evening with my parents in the living room because you only had one TV back in the good old days and no remote. But I remember watching television with my parents and when the commercial would come on that would show a little child in a foreign country, three, four years old, with a swollen belly, with flies all around, looking into the camera with those mournful eyes, and then you could sponsor this child and feed this child for $19.99 a month. I remember my parents oftentimes got up out of their chair and they changed the channel. They didn't say a word, but they changed the channel. I remember once my father remarked, well, I think he knew it was troubling me. He said, well, I know they got a camera crew there. They got help there. They're, they're feed this child. Oh, okay. As I got older and learned more about the world, I would say things like this oftentimes. Well, it's the governments of these countries. There's plenty of food to feed people, but it's the corruption and the governments and the leadership. That's the reason, you know, that these children are starving. And I would give all kinds of excuses. I would say, well, you know, I'm doing my part in other ways. And and I would sometimes say, well, you know, what about the hungry children in our own country? And what are we doing at home? And and, and, and you ever give God any of these excuses? Am Am I alone? I'm not alone, I hope. I hope I'm not alone. Has repeated exposure. We see it, we see it, and we see it but we believe it's so far away. We believe it's so far away. It's removed from us. We think, well, there, there, how many millions of ch- hungry children are there? How, 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 how big of a need is, what can I do? You know, what's one, what's one sponsorship? What's one child? We, we come up with all these things. Where's our inspiration? Where's our inspiration? And then we find Jesus at the end in verse 37. He says four words, go and do likewise. Go and do just like the Samaritan did. What is the application? Well, before before this message, what would you have understood the application to be? What what, what was it to be a good, what is it to be a good Samaritan? I I think many people believe it's roadside assistance. Right? You know, help people who are broke down on the side of the road. You know, I thought that for a long time when I was a teenager. I heard this sermon given in a Baptist church on Sunday night when I went to church with my buddy. And, and, and the pastor said, you know, mentioned that one application would be helping people who are stranded. And that, that was in early summer of 1992. You know, that's for cell phones, you know. Stop check on stranded motorists. You can help them out and be a good Samaritan. And I remember coming back from Tabanic, Virginia in August of 1992. I just turned 18 years old. And I went out to see my uncle in Tabanic, Virginia. And I was coming back on the way back. And I was in my 1980 blue Camaro. And I was cruising down the road and I was feeling so grown up, you know. First big trip I took out of Princeton, West Virginia. And I saw a Buick broke down on the side of the road. And I saw a couple people in it. So I hit the brakes real quick and I weaved over and and went into the medium, put it in reverse, backed up into the medium. And I looked in my rearview mirror. I remember this Buick because I saw the Buick badge. And I looked and there sat the sweetest elderly couple. They reminded me, they remind me rather of my mom and dad today. There they sat. And I'm sure they must have thought a lot of things when they saw 
that hot rod blue Camaro with the dual exhaust lifted up in the back, you know, and then they saw that West Virginia license plate staring at them. And then here I come out of the car in all my glory because, of course, it was August and my air conditioning was broke. So I had on a pair of flip-flops, a pair of Smoking Joe camel shorts and matching hat. Some of you remember Smoking Joe? Yeah, I looked like a walking billboard for the tobacco company. And to top it all off, I had on a pair of vintage Tom Cruise Top Gun shades, you know. And I walked up to the guy, and to, the, to this day, I still think I believe I heard the door, door locks from the lady sitting inside, but her husband got out, you know. And after I convinced him, and he become aware that I was not there to rob him for cigarette money, I guess, you know, he, he began to talk to me, you know, and I, he realized I was there to help. And he gave me a handful of quarters. And he said, sir, would you mind to take these quarters, go to the next phone booth. Remember those phone booths? And here's the name and the telephone number of my son who lives in the area. Would you mind to call him and tell him where we're at? And he wrote down the mile marker and the route and everything. I said, sure, be glad to do that. And I did it. Very next exit, very next phone booth, I called. His son answered, thankfully. I told him what happened. He said, I'll be there just as soon as I can. Thank you so much. And I got back into my Camaro and rode off into the proverbial sunset, thinking what? I was a good Samaritan. Oh, I fulfilled the parable of the good Samaritan. I did what Jesus said to do. I was one happy Nimrod, well, riding off in that sunset. But I want to ask you, did I really fulfill the teachings of Jesus? I did a nice thing. I did a good thing, don't get me wrong. But did I really fulfill the teachings of Jesus? No, I don't think I did. It's more than that. So what is it? What is application? Write this down. Write this down and don't forget it. This is how you can apply. This is how you can go do likewise, okay? You better listen and you better write down you better do it. All right, here we go. Identify people. in your world who are in need of mercy. And give them mercy. Identify people in your world who are in need of mercy and give them mercy. That's how you apply this. Is that simple? Identify people in your world in need of mercy and give them mercy. That's how we apply the teachings of this kingdom. And then right down below it, write this. Sorry if you put your pencils up already. Write this. Physical. 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 We talk about children. Compassion International. Compassion partners with more than 6,500 churches in 25 countries to release over 1.8 million children and young adults from poverty in Jesus' name. Compassion International. You want to sponsor a child? Look up Charity Navigator. They'll give you all kinds of things. They'll rate them for you. Baptist Global Response. Baptist Global Response. They're not affiliated with SBC, but they share our values. Oh, my goodness. You can go. And this is what I do for Christmas. I forgot to do it this year, but I'm going to do it in January. Sheila wants some more chickens. Well, you can buy 10 chickens for people in need for $25. You know what? I don't have to feed them. It's a wonderful thing. So I'll cut this out and wrap it up and give it to Sheila for Christmas. You know, I just bought you 10 chickens. Well, we don't have to take care of them. You know, oh my goodness, you can buy a goat for 75 bucks. <laughs> buy you a goat. You can do things like this. What, what, about, what about if you want to go into human trafficking? You know, for $10 you can give a victim of human trafficking a safe place for a day. What, what we're going to spend on lunch for one of us, you can provide a safe place for a victim of human trafficking for a whole day. A whole day. Medical care for a whole month, a victim of human trafficking, 25 $25 for a whole month of medical care. Water 
a well for $1,000, a filter for $25, medical care, supplies, clinic supplies. And look at this. You can feed a hungry child for a week. How much do you think it it costs to feed a hungry child for a week? $3.50. For a whole year, $182. Sometimes I splurge and buy me a sausage and egg biscuit at Bojangles. I like to do that sometimes on Friday. You know how much that cost me the last time I did that? $3.05. Check it for yourself. You can feed a child like this for a whole week for $3.50. Whole year for $182. You know what the truth is? We wouldn't even miss $182, would we, for a whole year? Let's be honest. We wouldn't miss it. Those of us who would, you know how we'd miss it? We'd have to stop eating out as much. Oh, boy, that would really hurt me. What about you? That'd be a big sacrifice, wouldn't it? We wouldn't be able to eat out as much to feed a child for a year. You know what, church? I have no doubt if this little boy, if this little boy was sitting out on the sidewalk as we all exited church, look at him. This little boy was sitting out there, and he said to you in English, would you mind to feed me for a year? I'm hungry. You can do it for $182. I am confident not one of us, not one of us, would walk past and say, nope, sorry, can't do that. But why do we anyway? Why why have I? Hey, I'm preaching this myself. Like I said, the Lord Jesus Christ convicted me because I come up with all the excuses. You know why? He's far away. It's just a picture. And there are so many others like him. There's so many other like them. Physical needs. Church, I know some of you are already, you're already supporting children like this. You're already giving. Physical needs. Good. But if you're not, if you're not, you have to. Because that's loving your neighbor in a practical way. Read the book of James. Read the book of James. Remember what James said? What good does it do if you see someone in need, see brother or sister in need, that needs clothing, needs food, and you say, Go your way, be blessed, be fed, be clothed. But you don't do anything. How's that showing the love of God? We have to meet physical needs to love our neighbors. Okay? But if you're already doing that, you say, Pastor, I've got that box checked. I'm doing what I can. Good. If you're not, you better. Because we're making a change in the Belcher household, okay? We're making a change. I already talked to you about last night. We're making a change. We're going to do it. No more excuses. We're going to do it. Spirit FM, you hear about these kids who are suffering from parasites in their stomach? You can, what, help help them and and cure them for, what, $30 a month? Remember that? All kinds of options. Research it for yourself. But you've got to meet physical needs to go and do likewise. Second, emotionally. Not only physically, but emotionally. Emotionally. Who can you identify in your world? in need of mercy emotionally. Who's lonely? Who's lonely? Who's grieving? Who's in need for mercy emotionally? Who wants somebody to talk to them? To care about them? Can you identify anybody? You know what? If you can't, please call me. Please call me. Because I got a list. I got a long list, and I can't, I cannot, I don't have the time or the energy to show them the mercy that they need, people who are hurting emotionally, who are lonely, who just need someone to know they care about them, to say a word of prayer. I cannot do it all. Please call me. If you don't know of anybody, please call me. I will give you just one person you can reach out to. I know a lot of people in need of emotional mercy. And finally, spiritually. Spiritually. Who's in need of of mercy and compassion, spiritually speaking? Who can you share the truth and the comfort of God's word with? I don't do Facebook, but if you do do Facebook, what does your Facebook page look like? 
I mean, let's be honest here. I don't know. I don't do Facebook. But is your Facebook containing more pithy little quotes and neat little stories and political stuff? Or does it have any of the truth of God's Word in it at all? You may think, well, I've tried to share Scripture on Facebook, but I don't get any likes. I don't know about Facebook to know about the likes thing. I don't get any likes when I share Scripture. Nobody really cares, right? Hey, you don't know. You don't know how sharing a verse of Scripture may meet someone's spiritual need. You can have compassion and mercy on somebody. Share the truth of God's Word with them. So this is a direct application, folks. I've given you some ideas, but there are so many more ways. But when Jesus said, go and do likewise, he meant what he said. And we cannot just close this book and say, okay, I'll apply it my own way. I'll go out and look for a stranded motorist. Well, I hate to tell you, all stranded motorists today, 99% of them, 99.9% of them have got cell phones. So that really doesn't apply, does it? And if they're broke down, not only do half of their contacts know, but probably half of Botetourt County knows if they're stuck on the side of the road. So forget about that application. You've got to find people who need mercy and compassion. Give it to them, whatever way they need it. And Lord Jesus, we thank you for this truth, Lord. And we ask you, oh God, please forgive me. I, I've already asked for forgiveness. Lord, I, I confess, Lord, my hardened heart, my lack of compassion for children and, and those in need. Lord, I, I confess, Lord, but I'm going to make a change. I'm going to change. That's, that's what we have to do. We've got to change our behavior. Knowledge is not enough. We've got to apply it. We've got to practice it. Lord, this is, this is nuts and bolts. This is as easy as it gets. Go and do likewise. Lord, now we know what that is. God, we pray, please help us to be obedient. Oh God, children are precious to you. Lord, I didn't mention St. Jude's Hospital. What about St. Jude's? Wouldn't we have compassion if we saw a child suffering with cancer in our family, in our midst? Lord, how can we walk around on the other side because this child is not affiliated with our family. He's not one of anybody in my family. Lord, if we do that, aren't we just like the Pharisee and the Levite? Aren't we just like the priest and the Levite? So God, I know you have changed people's hearts. You've awakened them. We thank you, Lord. You've done this. Your words is what we've read. We thank you, Lord, for faithfully teaching us. And Lord, I pray your people would make the changes you desire. Lord, if they're already giving, maybe they would give more. If they're already helping, maybe they would help more. Lord, forgive us for our calloused hearts, our hard hearts. Creating us a new heart, soft and open to your will. Now, church, I know this may not be a message you want to come up at the altar, but if you want to, if you feel led to, please come. Kneel down and pray. But the main thing is, you got to make a change, I got to make a change. We got to go and do. That's what God wants us to do. That's what our Lord wants us to do. Make a change. Do better. So I trust, church, you will do that. And I trust you know the parable of the Good Samaritan much better. And Father, we thank you for your patience. Lord Jesus, for your patience. Oh, you are so long-suffering with us. Thank you, O oh Lord, for second chances, for forgiveness. Thank you for your truth.
now, Lord, encourage us as we sing this closing song. And thank you once again for your everlasting love. How deep is your love for us? In Christ Jesus.